Welcome to the first robotics seminar of the fall semester. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today, Vladen Colton. Um, Vladen um, got his PhD from Tel Aviv University in 2002 and then was a postdoc at Berkeley. Uh, some of you might not know that actually at that time he was not even working in computer vision or robotics, he was working on theoretical computer science. Uh, after that, he got on the faculty at Stanford and he has been leading research group in industry for a while now, doing groundbreaking work in computer vision, computer graphics, robotics, and AI. Um, he has been doing research on many cool topics, like you know, too many to cover, but including geometric computer vision, quadruped navigation, drone navigation, out throughput computer vision, among many others. And indeed, some software tools that he developed as part of, of research can be something that you're using right now. These include the Carla simulator that many of you might be using, Open3D, uh, Midas, which is monocular depth estimation, uh, DSO, which is direct sparse odometry. And of course, he got you know, many recognition for his work. I will mention just like you know, three of them. The NSF Career Award, he's a Sloan Fellow, and uh, more recently was recognized with the SIGGRAPH Test of Time Award at uh, SIGGRAPH 2023. And I think it's a testament of the relevance and impact of his work, the fact that we have this audience, this very large audience, on the day of the ICRA deadline. So thanks for joining today. <laughs> thanks for postponing like, you know, your paper submission like, you know, by one hour. Really appreciate it. And without further ado, let's welcome Vladen. Thank you. Yeah, these test of time awards basically officially certify that you are now old. This is how you know it's the beginning of the end. So. The first thing I need to explain is the title, A Quiet, Re a Quiet Revolution in Robotics Continued. Uh, this is what a quiet revolution in robotics looks like according to Mid Journey, and who am I to argue? The quiet revolution I speak of is uh, the revolution brought by harnessing the power of simulation and understanding the proper role of simulation in robotics, and in particular, developing and using a number of design patterns for transferring policies from simulation to the real world and deploying them on real physical systems that significantly advance the state of the art on real robots in the physical world. And I will argue today that at this point, the advances have been so significant and so conclusive and have happened on problems in robotics that are so broadly recognized as central to the field that the skepticism that traditionally uh, accompanied or faced the use of simulation in robotics at this point is not tenable without additional justification. At this point, given the results that uh, we have demonstrated, the burden of proof would be on the skeptics. Um, I think with the results that I will show today, as well as in another talk that I will refer to in, uh, in a moment, um, the burden of proof, if someone should say, oh, simulation has no place in robotics, at this, at this point, I think the burden of proof shifts to them to justify their uh, position. Now, why continued? Continued because I gave a talk three days ago at Princeton as a distinguished colloquium called A Quiet Revolution in Robotics. And the talk is on YouTube. So here is what we're trying to do here. Today, to you, I am giving a completely standalone talk. You should not feel, feel like you missed anything. And to the Princeton audience, I gave a standalone talk, and hopefully they did not feel like they missed anything. There is zero overlap between the talks. I'm not repeating a single slide, and I am not repeating content. But people who will watch the recordings of the two talks back to back later on YouTube should feel like they got two parts of a coherent talk, two complementary, non-overlapping parts that actually fit together like two nice pieces of a puzzle. In the previous talk, I reviewed a body of work on legged uh, locomotion that was done in collaboration with Marco Hutter and his students at ETH Zurich. Today, 
I will talk about a completely complementary and largely independent body of work that we have developed over the last six years in agile flight, culminating in the last two weeks in two papers published in Nature, on the cover of Nature two weeks ago, and in Science Robotics just earlier this week on the cover of this month's Science Robotics. I will lead up to, and of course devote some time to these two papers, but I will really start from the beginning, from when we started doing this work and the very first baby steps six years ago, and I will walk you through the whole trajectory of um, our development in this area. All the work that I will talk about today was done in collaboration with Davide Scaramuzza and um, two generations of extraordinary PhD students that Davide supervised at University of uh, Zurich. So you will see a lot of University of Zurich uh, logos uh, everywhere, in particular on all the physical facilities, because all the physical work, all the heavy lifting, all the actual drones were in Zurich in uh, the University of uh, Zurich facilities. We started this work um, six years ago, and at this point, we just wanted to push through a proof of concept for a vision-based drone with fully onboard, self-contained sensing and computation that flies autonomously and attempts to race. I mean, we wanted to race. What we really wanted to do is what we did six years later um, and was reported two weeks ago, which is we wanted to be the human world champions in a recognized sport that humans developed for their own entertainment, which is drone racing. So we wanted to beat the human world champions in drone racing, but we weren't even close. We were orders of magnitude away. The first stop was, step was to just somehow fly in a system that's self-contained, that has onboard uh, computation and sensing it doesn't cheat. So remember that at that time, the most impressive results were dr with drones, which looked incredible. You had these drones doing acrobatic maneuvers uh, and Cirque du Soleil level, um, level performances, except it, it was all in motion capture. It was all in instrumented environments, but we wanted to do this in the wild. So no instrumentation, uh, just a camera and an or onboard computer. So I will show you this, this really looks like baby steps now. This, this really, in retrospect, looks, uh, um, looks cute. Cute would be the kind word. OK, so this is Elia, um, one of the PhD students who, who ended up being the first author six years later on, uh, on the Nature paper that just came out. So he, this is him in the beginning of his PhD. This drone is, quote unquote, racing <laughs> through this racetrack. Through these, uh, through these gates. So the sport is that you need to pass through a sequence of, uh, of gates in a set order. You want to do this fast, um, and this by some definition of fast was fast. By nobody's definition of fast was this actually fast. But it flew, it, uh, it passed. How was this trained? There was a gate detector, a convolutional uh, network, that was uh, predicting a waypoint, a waypoint that was, uh, was then driven towards by a uh, controller. One thing that's interesting here is that uh, the drone did not maintain a global map of the environment. The environment didn't really need to be pre-mapped. And the environment didn't even need to be static, as I will show you. We're trying to push against the heavily mapping-based approaches that needed to pre-map the environment and maintain a map of the environment. We wanted to be a bit lighter weight and uh, more flexible. So to a first approximation, there is, there is no map. Uh, the uh, controller reasons in body frame. The drone reasons in body frame. It, it, it tries to detect the gate uh, in front of it using 
basically a now standard and even then fairly standard um, computer vision architecture, a convolutional uh, neural network, and then based, uh, based on that, predict where it, uh, it needs to uh, steer. Very simple. Let me show you some more results. And I think here in this segment, you will see the gates being moved uh, around. By the way, they're wearing ski masks, not because they're criminals, but because this was an anonymous submission to a conference. <laughs> okay, so they're moving the, uh, the gates around. They're not moving them so that the drone passes. They're trying to, uh, to move them out of the way of the drone, and the drone adapts and, and steers towards uh, the gates. And uh, the intended conclusion is that the gate is, is, uh, is that the drone is not attached to a static map of the environment. And particularly in this dynamic regime, um, our system at the time dramatically outperformed what seemed like a credible baseline based on uh, visual inertial odometry uh, and, uh, and, and, a, and a more classic control um, methodology. Um, certainly, uh, when the gates are dynamic, the map-based approaches these ones that assume that the map remains the same fail, uh, and and that was that was definitely the experience in uh, uh, in the controlled evaluation. By the way, I have nothing against visual inertial odometry per se. You will see that we do use visual inertial odometry in uh, in in later later work. Uh, this system, uh, this paper, ended up getting a nice award uh, at the conference on robot learning. The conference version, I have to say, the vision system, the convolutional network that detected the gates, was trained on real data of someone flying the drone uh, through, uh, through a track. We, uh, we thought we could do better. And in a follow-up version, a journal version of this paper, we showed that we can train everything entirely in simulation, which will be quite consistent with my theme today. So th this was trained in these very simple psychedelic environments with different gate shapes and, uh, and different camera and different background textures. And the intention was to make the gate detector very robust to uh, gate textures illumination, other forms of lighting conditions, motion blur, other camera artifacts. And that's basically what ended up happening. Here you can see tests in very different illumination conditions, and the gate flies. That is reasonably impressive, but maybe more impressive when you remember that the vision system was trained entirely in simulation. This one didn't see any real data, OK? So this is transfer from those psychedelic, uh, colorful environments to the real world. One of our next steps was to tackle high-performance acrobatic maneuvers that are challenging even for human pilots. This is something that if you can do as a human drone pilot, you're considered fairly advanced. Maneuvers like the barrel roll, power loop, matty flip, you will see videos in a moment. And again, some of these are outside because we want to make the point that the system is completely self-contained and is not relying on any external instrumentation. So for example, many of us uh, admired the early work on uh, helicopter flight uh, that was uh, that was done by our friends and colleagues uh, Andrew Eng and uh, and Peter Beal and Adam Coates, and that was amazing. But that actually relied uh, on an external camera that was tracking uh, the helicopter state. This, uh, in contrast, is just completely self-contained. So you will see the deployments in uh, in different environments. Doesn't need any external cameras or. Uh, God forbid motion capture or anything, anything like that. Here are some videos.
So these are executed autonomously. This was trained entirely in simulation by first optimizing a trajectory in, uh, in simulation and optimizing a sequence of controls and then training a student policy that is tracking uh, those controls in simulation. So the optimal trajectory was first optimized knowing the true uh, state of the system at any time, which you can only do in simulation. This was basically using privileged information in simulation. And then a neural network, a multi-layer perceptron policy that mapped from inputs to uh, actions was trained to track that trajectory as precisely as possible, and that policy did not cheat. So let me, uh, let me show you the architecture and then point out a few things about it. So uh, first, we take some visual input, and we take inertial data from the IMU. All of these are fed to uh, TCMs, temporal convolutional networks. These are neural networks with uh, quite a bit of history, quite a bit of memory that can uh, extract features from a pretty long temporal window. How do you feed images, information from images into a sequence model? One key, and that was really a central idea in, uh, in this paper, is that we did not use images directly. In fact, we used the classic feature tracker, basically a KLT type feature tracker, to extract features from the image. That accomplished two goals. First, we could summarize these feature tracks uh, through a point uh, neural network, a point net type model that extracted features that summarized the distribution of these feature tracks in space, and then feed that to a sequence model, which was compact and also compressed the information from the image, the motion flow in uh, the image in a very nice way. Then all of this could be fed to a multi-layer perceptron, and a multi-layer perceptron can be deployed in real time and run in real time on embedded hardware on a little constrained quadcopter. So a little quadcopter, certainly not at the time and not even today, will not run a big vision transformer or a big uh, giant convolutional network, even if you, uh, you wanted to. That is not something you can, uh, you can run on a system like this. So we do use neural networks, but they have to be small. The other huge advantage of abstracting the visual data in this way is that this abstraction facilitates successful transfer from simulation to reality. Essentially, think of a color image, a color image in simulation, a color image in reality. It's very easy for, for those two to look very different, uh, okay? Uh, even looking at a Pixar movie, it's kind of clear they're, they're not quite there. It's not indistinguishable from a photograph. Now, look at a depth map, okay? If you look at a depth map, actually it becomes harder to distinguish. It becomes maybe harder to distinguish a computer graphics, high fidelity computer graphics from, uh, from the real world. Then maybe, uh, maybe look at something opti like optical flow. Also, uh, maybe, maybe harder, harder to distinguish. Look at feature tracks, just a few isolated points, you know, KLT tracker output, a few isolated points moving, moving through space. Now maybe almost indistinguishable, maybe indistinguishable, maybe you would find it hard to tell side by side which one is coming from a Pixar movie, which one is coming from uh, a real recording from reality. That was uh, the key idea and one of the patterns I want to point out today. The use of a very abstract compressed representation of uh, the visual input, in this case feature tracks, allowed us to go from this, which, which is laughable from a computer's graphic standpoint, it is so unrealistic, 
but really, the system was trained on this as the visual input, OK? And allowed us to deploy in uh, the, real, uh, the real world and successfully. So here is a summary of this uh, design pattern. We analyzed it in, in detail and devoted more or less a whole paper to it uh, in another paper we published at the Conference on Robot Learning in 2018, Driving Policy Transfer via Modularity and Abstraction. I hope you appreciate the, the play with colors here. You see, blue uh, represents visual input from simulation. Green represents visual input from real cameras. But wait for it. They have the same luminance. So you see, luminance is the abstract representation. And the luminance in these two blocks is the same. Right? I'm very proud of this. OK. After this, we wanted to do uh, things in more cluttered, more realistic uh, environments. And uh, so we trained policies to traverse cluttered, realistic, natural environments at high speeds. The acrobatic maneuvers you saw in the previous paper were really done basically in open air, no obstacles. So what, what we were excited about is that we could get the drone uh, to fly at pretty high speeds, high accelerations. I don't remember the numbers, but I think maybe the accelerations there uh, went up to 2 or 3G, which was, uh, which was already pretty, pretty intense. And we wanted to see that we could execute high performance, um, agile, agile maneuvers autonomously without any external, uh, external instrumentation. But open air, OK? Nothing else exists. The drone is out in the open. Contrast with this. Good. So here, the drone is given a goal some distance away. It's in a cluttered, natural environment. It does not have a map, OK? There's no instrumentation. It's taken into a new environment. It is looking at it right now for the first time. Hasn't been pre-mapped. It's, it's told, go over there 100 meters away as fast as you can. And you know, if you need to fly through a forest, then you're flying uh, through, through a forest. Here is the overall architecture. It, it has some similarity uh, to other architectures you've seen before. There are also some differences. So some similarities are trained entirely in simulation. This thing was trained entirely in, uh, in simulation. It does get uh, visual input. This visual input is abstracted. The abstraction here is not as extreme as just taking feature tracks, because then we needed the drone to see the environment at, at, at higher resolution. We, we wanted it to see more detail about the environment. So the abstraction here is a, uh, a depth map. Uh, the real drone has a stereo camera, and it is trained on simulated stereo data using stereo depth serves as an abstraction over something like a color camera. And we have taken extra steps to narrow the centurial gap by running a real stereo algorithm in simulation on the simulated images. We essentially have a simulated stereo camera taking two images and running it through semi-global matching, an actual stereo matching algorithm, to produce uh, depth maps with realistic artifacts like, uh, like disocclusion uh, bound, uh, boundaries you will see in the next image. So that depth is then, uh, is then taken through a, an encoder and, um, and given to a controller. The controller is trained in simulation. It is also trained in two steps at two levels. There is a more classic sampling-based planner 
that given the depth map and the goal, plans a trajectory uh, for, for the near horizon that it wants the drone to execute, then there is a model predictive controller that is tracking that trajectory. That relies on privileged information. That's, first of all, slow because you need to sample. Um, but with enough sampling and enough compute and privileged information, you can, um, you can know that you're synthesizing a very good trajectory that will get you to the goal. That is our privileged teacher. That is something we do in simulation and really cheat. We cheat by, uh, by computing a very good path by tapping into the ground truth map, the ground truth layout of the environment. But given this privileged teacher, we can then train a neural network that will predict this trajectory. This neural network can be trained with the trajectory optimized by the privileged teacher as supervision. Yes? Could you comment on the level of fidelity in the physics of the, of the simulator, or are you papering over it with randomization and robustness? Yeah, here I don't remember it being a blocking issue. Our friends at, U uh, at University of Zurich have this flight mare simulator that have a pretty good dynamics model for the quadrotor. There are some aerodynamic phenomena that it does not capture, like turbulence. Things that are very hard to simulate, it doesn't. But as far as uh, quadrotor dynamics models, it's pretty good, and in this case, was good enough. You will see in the next work, it wasn't good enough, and we had to do something to bridge the symptoreal gap in the dynamics as well. Good. So here is the way we dealt with the symptoreal gap in uh, perception. So here is a ground truth uh, depth map in simulation. Here is a depth map produced by a simulated stereo camera, and you can see that at least qualitatively it has some of the same artifacts that a real stereo image has. And that made a difference. Essentially, if we didn't do this and we trained on these clean depth maps, the policy didn't transfer well to the real world, but when we trained on these simulated depth maps with, with, with much more realistic noise characteristics, they transferred well. I'm going to make the same point again in the video. So here on the left, you see the, uh, the, the synthesized stereo depth produced by a simulated stereo uh, camera. And here it is in larger format. And by the way, here, if I didn't tell you that this is simulation, maybe you wouldn't have known. Maybe you would have thought, if I told you that this is real feed from a, uh, from a real flight through a forest, some of you would have, would have believed me. Good. Which brings us to, uh, to the paper published a couple, a couple of weeks ago, which we, where we indeed had to, um, uh, had to work harder uh, on, on the dynamics, because this was in a much higher performance uh, regime. So here, six years later, we basically did what we said when we all got together and initiated our collaboration that someday we want to do. Uh, we outraced human world champions in FPV world racing, first uh, drone racing, first person view drone uh, racing. And we outraced them with a completely autonomous drone that is completely self contained. So all the sensing and computation is on board. It, it has a camera, uh, it has a little Jetson TX2 GPU uh, that is uh, running inference on. Uh, on neural networks, and uh, here is a summary. So here is a track designed by a professional uh, drone racer, uh, one of the tracks we used. Here is a shot of, of the two drones passing, uh, passing through a gate. Uh, the blue one is, uh, is ours. Uh, we named our system SWIFT so that we could call one of the sections in our paper the SWIFT system and chuckle. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, and uh, the red drone is flown by uh, a human world champion. There are actually multiple human world champions in this sport because this is one of those sports that has multiple competing world leagues like golf and some, some forms of martial arts. So there are actually two worldwide leagues in uh, first person view uh, drone racing. And uh, uh, back then, so this was in pandemic time so some world championships, because this is a physical sport, actually did not take place during the pandemic. That's why they are the 2019 world champions, because, for example, the 2020 championship did not uh, take place. So Alex Vanover is the world champion in one league. Uh, Thomas Bitmata is uh, the world champion in the other league. Uh, and we also brought in Marvin Shepper, who was the local um, Swiss champion, and he was there, uh, and he was he was close, and uh, we organized an event in Zurich in which they agreed to come and race autonomous drones. This is what it looks like. So the human pilots wear headsets through which they see the world from the point of view of the drone. They get an analog video feed because analog can be streamed uh, at lower latency than, than digital, and latency matters. So everything is custom and everything is optimized in this sport for high performance. The, the drones are optimized for high performance. The controllers are custom. This is a televised sport. For us, this was... Uh, important that this is a sport that existed. We didn't invent it. We didn't modify it. It is a televised physical sport that humans invented for their own entertainment. OK? So this was a fairly elaborate system because it had to accomplish a few goals at the same time. Time. Uh, you had to learn and fit the data uh, very precisely. You have to operate at the very edge of the capabilities of the robot. And you have to be extremely lightweight. Our drone was completely compatible, was completely the same as the human flown drone in all the important dimensions. Weight. Um, physical dimensions, it was uh, the power of the motors, it was the same. So we couldn't carry you know, an A100 GPU uh, on, uh, on, uh, on this thing. So it also had to, be, had to be compact, and many decisions were made with that in mind. So there is a gate detector that is running and is, uh, is detecting the gate. There is a VIO system. Uh, this is running on a dedicated uh, VIO stick, basically, a T265. Uh, uh, yes, a real sense T265 T that is doing VIO in uh, real time and is streaming the VIO state along with the image. So, um, so the real sense camera is a stereo camera. It streams out by USB images at, uh, at 30 hertz, um, uh, or at least we ingested them at 30 hertz because other parts of the system operated at 30 hertz, like the, the gate detector worked at, uh, at 30 hertz. Um, so we get the detection from the gate, we get, we get the VIO state, and uh, we integrate them with a Kalman filter uh, into a six DOF pose of the robot. That six DOF pose, uh, six degree of freedom pose, is processed by a multi-layer perceptron. We couldn't fit anything heavier than that uh, into, uh, into the system. And, uh, and it produces actions. And these are exactly the same actions, the same control signals that the human, humans use, OK, um, body rates. How was this trained? This was trained entirely in simulation with some clever exceptions. Uh, so 
the RL training, the training of the, of the controller, was trained in simulation. I will show you a visualization in a moment. And what happens is, if you just do what I just said, without other ideas, it doesn't work. The reason it doesn't work is because the simulated visual input in simulation is just too far from uh, the data that the camera really gets in the physical world. And there is a discrepancy in the physics as well. And in these high performance regimes, uh, aerodynamic effects, uh, as well as weird delays and, uh, uh, and unmodeled phenomena in the quad, uh, copter itself kick in. Uh, and the same control signals don't do the same thing over time in the physical system as they do in simulation. So what happens is we train a controller in simulation. Then we deploy it in reality. It flies several loops, and we measure the deviations. We measure the deviations in uh, the dynamics, and we measure the deviations in the perception in the estimated six degree of freedom state of the robot. And to these deviations, we fit function approximators. We basically fit empirical noise models to these uh, two um, deviations, these two residuals. One is the perception residual, the difference between the actual empirically observed six DOF pose versus the, uh, the predicted six DOF pose and the difference in the, uh, the controls. And with one loop of that, one of these outer loops of fitting an empirical uh, noise model to the perception and the dynamics, the whole thing goes through. The next time, uh, we retrain the policy in simulation with these residuals, or rather we fine tune it uh, with, uh, with these residuals in simulation put the fine-tuned policy on the physical system, and it works. And that's what raced uh, with the physical, uh, with the uh, Are there any differences with the output of the policy? Are there actually the propeller speeds, or there is another controller after the output of the So uh, here you're getting into, into quadcopter details that where, where I, might, uh, I might not have the full, uh, the full resolution. It's thrust and body rates. Um, but I've always just been told that that's, that's what it is. And since I don't fly the uh, flight or race quadcopters myself, I'm not sure I have the fully correct perception, uh, really, of what, how that relates to other, uh, other possible control signals. Yeah. I think there is a map in the tool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Apparently, so this is what, uh, what, what high performance human FPV pilots use. So this is their preferred uh, controller representation. This is what they feed uh, through, the, through the controller to, uh, uh, to the quads. OK, this is a visualization of a real RL training in simulation. It's flailing about, and over time, it's starting to uh, fly better and better. Um, what actually happens is about 100 agents are being trained in parallel on a single workstation. And the whole training takes less than an hour on a, works, on a single uh, workstation. I will, I will get back to this in a moment. And uh, here is a visualization of those residual models. I'm not sure how informative the visualization is. You can at least see that this thing is not Gaussian. It's weird. And it makes sense to estimate it empirically from, uh, from, from real data. So at least that should, uh, should click. OK, um, I invite you to, uh, uh, to look at the paper in detail and look at all the experiments and the races. There, uh, there were several days uh, with, with hundreds of laps in total uh, raced by uh, the human pilots and by Swift and overall Swift won, okay, by all the metrics uh, that, that one, one would imagine, perhaps. So the very fastest run by Swift was faster than the very fastest run clocked by any of the human champions. The median was faster 
Uh, and it won the most head-to-head -head races as well. So in terms of racing, racing, it also won. Yes. Um, was it just a matter of data efficiency, why you didn't learn like the entire dynamics model, or is there some other motivation why you wanted to do it this way? Yeah, excellent question. Um, we didn't want to raise that much in, uh, in the physical world. So just assume that there's a really non-trivial chance that you will destroy the drone in this regime every time you race, every time you drew a lap. Um, and, and so the fewer <laughs> laps, training laps, uh, we, 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 uh, we did in the physical world, the better, the more feasible the whole project was. Yeah. Is there interaction between the two agents in a head-to-head -head race, or is it mostly? Excellent question. I love it. Hold that. I will get back to it. I will mention it on a slide. Yeah. Are the human and the drone getting the same number of training trials? Like Hold that. I will address that. Excellent question number two. Love it. OK, OK. Let's, uh, let, uh, let me get then to, uh, to the discussion. Let me maybe. OK, I'll, I'll dwell on it in a moment, uh, for a moment just as a teaser for the paper that has uh, some detailed analyses of, of what is it that Swift did better. Um, it did a few things better. One of them I will, I, I will dwell on later. But one thing that it did better is more or less what you, what you would expect. It just found better ways uh, to do really non-trivial physical maneuvers. Like, there, there are these two gates, one above, above the other, and Swift can just execute a better trajectory. It can, can reliably uh, save, save time. The human overshoots and does something that maybe seems intuitively, uh, to, um, in, in, intuitively uh, more optimal to the human, but Swift just finds a better, uh, a better way to do this maneuver. Uh, likewise, with this gate configuration, Swift just cut more optimally through uh, that turn and reliably. Like when RL found uh, this control sequence that would get it uh, more tightly through this turn, that's basically what it did every time. So uh, here are the kinds of things that come up in conversation with, uh, with friends and colleagues that talk about this work and also among, amongst ourselves. We've had enough time to reflect. So I'll, uh, I'll walk you through, through some detailed points and some discussion that, uh, that maybe it's, is not in the paper because the paper is not the right uh, kind of format for philosophizing and free form discussion. But I, I want to philosophize a bit and, uh, and discuss, discuss free form and maybe phrase some things in, in a more intuitive, clearer, clearer way. So first of all, what compute is, uh, is this thing running? Uh, it's, it, it has a Jetson, T, uh, Jetson TX2 and, uh, and, and a real sense uh, stereo camera that does via your own board on a dedicated ASIC. So that was important. If we had to run VIO, ourselves on the Jetson, it would have hogged the Jetson and we wouldn't, uh, wouldn't have had enough, uh, enough compute for, uh, for the neural network inference. Or maybe we would have had to code even harder uh, to, uh, to fit everything in. But we were, we were really at the edge of the compute capabilities. One interesting thing about it is that this hardware more or less was available about five years ago. So structurally, this could have been done five years ago. Okay, there's nothing here that's kind of, that got structurally unlocked. Certainly architecturally, MLPs were around. So it kind of feels like this could have been done uh, five, uh, five years ago. The drones have the same weight propulsion and overall uh, dimensions. We put ballast um, in to equalize the Jetson and RealSense, which the human drone uh, doesn't do. The drones were designed and put together in collaboration uh, with with the prof with professional uh, professional racers, so we made sure that whatever we do, they they kind of sign off on as a legitimate thing uh, thing to do. If anything, uh, Swift is at a disadvantage because it has this clunky real sense. You can actually see it uh, in the image. It really sticks out in front and messes with the aerodynamics, whereas the human dr flown drone doesn't. Okay, so if anything, aerodynamically, Swift is at a, 
at a disadvantage. Roboticists, my, uh, my, my experience in the last, in the last few months, robot, uh, some roboticists just tend to assume that we put QR codes on the gates. We did not, okay? I would have considered that cheating. That racing pattern, okay, that's just a design. It has no functional significance, um, okay? We could have painted anything. So the gate detector is trained actually on, on real data um, by flying through a track with these gates and actually annotating the gates, which Elia did. We, he built special software for annotating gates to get enough data to train the gate detector. Not the most self-supervised, uh, maybe future-proof way. We kind of think maybe we can do this in simulation too with a bit less work, but that's, that's what was done. Uh, those tools were around, that methodology was around. The, the point here is that any gate design would have worked and QR codes would have, would have failed anyway. Even if we wanted to put QR codes on the thing, there was so much motion blur at these speeds. We're, we're, we're talking speeds of on the order of 100 kilometers an hour. Uh, and, and these things rotate um, uh, very, at, at very high angular accelerations as well. QR co codes would have, would have failed anyway. Now, here is something that genuinely is different and, and, um, and Swift may have, I mean, Swift has some structural advantages. One of these is that Swift ingests inertial data, okay? So Swift really gets, uh, really taps into accelerometers that are on the vehicle. This is akin to, this is what your vestibular system would be doing for you if you were in the vehicle. This is, this is what the vestibular system for a Formula One racer does or an actual fighter pilot that is in the aircraft. Swift is in that position. It is in the vehicle, it has a quote-unquote vestibular system, the IMU the, the, that, is, that is feeding it inertial data, okay? That's, that's on, uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, you could say humans have a structural advantage right there because they can use off-board computation. I mean, they get to carry three pounds of, uh, of computer uh, in their heads, okay? So maybe, maybe that's... Uh, that's an advantage, okay? Eh, uh, you, you can discuss that. Ultimately, we can just agree that here they really are different. This is not the same. The two sides uh, really are different. There is a transmission latency, for example, from, from the camera. These are highly optimized, so the analog feed has lower latency than, than a comparable digital uh, camera feed uh, would have, but uh, there is still latency of the camera to the, the headset. And then there is latency from the controller to the drone. In total, that latency, the whole loop, is about 30 and 40 milliseconds. Upon reflection, we should have absolutely com compensated for this. It wouldn't have made any difference to the result because the gap between Swift and the human pilots is much larger. But it would have been the right thing to do. I, I regret that we didn't do it. Uh, it slipped our minds, okay? We, we realized after the fact, darn, uh, there were 30, 40 milliseconds of latency uh, that were unfair because Swift it sits right there on the jets. It gets a USB feed, okay? It doesn't suffer from this latency, but to, to make it clear, would have made no difference. We should have done it, but it would have made no difference. Now, there, there is also another, uh, there, there is another latency that's bigger that's not the same, also wouldn't have made any difference. Here it's actually less clear uh, what, what the right position is. Is it fair, unfair? And that's the latency within the human body, okay? Uh, you could say basically, well, it's on the human. They, uh, they, they have their nervous system, they chose it. Uh, you know, they, <laughs> they get to live with it. But there generally is latency as uh, the signal propagates and is processed from your eyes to your, to your visual cortex through your brain, through your nervous system, out into the fingers, uh, right, uh, that actuate the controller. And that latency in total is on the order uh, of eh, 220 
20 milliseconds. Okay, uh, it, it's, I mean, as you can imagine, it's actually hard to measure it precisely. There are methodologies. It's kind of there, roughly, uh, for, for, for champion level performance on the order of 200 to 250 milli, uh, milliseconds. For SWIFT, this is basically our neural network inference. That, that takes time, and that's on the order of 40 milliseconds. So there are still, there's still a gap, okay? Even if we equalize that gap, where the case is less clear whether we should have, um, still would have won, okay? SWIFT still, still would have won. The gap, uh, the, the gap was bigger. On the other side, humans actually update their signal and get to update their signal at higher frame rate. So they're slightly lagged, by, but their control signal is more continuous, okay? The camera feed they get is at 120 hertz, which we do not ingest. Uh, we operate at 30, uh, 30 hertz, because our latency also demands our frame, uh, determines our frame rate, um, okay? So we can operate at most at 30 hertz, and, uh, and usually are at 20 to 25 hertz. Uh, whereas humans actually do, if you look at professional gamers, like esports gamers, and, and measure what update, update rate for the, uh, for the display makes a difference for them, and at what rate they can provide control signal, uh, they do go up to uh, like the 100 hertz, uh, hertz regime, and that's an advantage you could say that humans have. Um, humans respond, um, Swift responds faster to the start signal. Part of it is unfair, and we equalized for that. That we did realize, and it, uh, it occurred to us. What is unfair is that Swift gets a digital start signal, whereas the start signal to the humans propagates to the speaker, plays through the speaker, and the waveform takes some time uh, to, uh, to arrive at, at the human's ears. And just the speaker has latency. That we measured and we equalized for. We introduced an artificial delay before we send the di digital start signal to Swift. Even after correcting for that delay, Swift is still faster uh, just because of the inter-body uh, latency. Um, right? That's about 120 milliseconds. Uh, Swift takes its roughly 40 milliseconds for, for, the, uh, for its computation. Uh, the drone, um, uh, the drone, uh, the drone takes off, and uh, the human takes a little bit longer to process the auditory data and to actuate, actuate the drone. Swift still would have won, okay? Even if all of this, we would, we would have, um, uh, we would have introduced artificial delays for all of this. Swift still would have won. Swift does not reason about the opponent. And in fact, this is a huge opportunity to make the performance much better. So what happens is Swift races quite aggressively. So there is a, a, a trade-off between how aggressively you race, how much risk you take. Basically, um, you can operate at higher thrust to weight uh, ratios, race very aggressively, but there's more noise. And sometimes you're going to clip gate boundaries and crash. Okay. So you basically, what happens is you complete fewer laps, but the ones you complete, you complete faster. And there is kind of, there, there is this trade-off, and, uh, and, and Swift sets this trade-off at a certain point. The, the smart thing to do, which we didn't do at all, and which is a huge opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to advance performance, is to start out taking higher risk, racing more aggressively. When you establish a definitive lead, you, uh, you, you, you slow down a bit, take less risk, clip fewer gates, but just maintain your lead. Clip basically is not aware of its opponent. It just races as fast as possible. It does one thing. It, it completely ignores where the opponent is. Am I winning? Am I losing? It doesn't even reason in, uh, in these terms. Both sides practice for the track. Now, Swift gets a map and trains in simulation for 50 minutes in wall clock time, which is 23 consecutive days of nonstop practice in its subjective time. Okay, so if any of you saw the White Christmas episode of Black Mirror, um, you, you, will, you will understand the analogy. But okay, this thing goes through 23 subjective days of nonstop practice. 
um, which on a single workstation is 20 sec uh, 50 seconds of, um, sorry, 50 minutes of uh, wall clock time, plus there are 50 seconds of real world data for those uh, residual models. Pilots practice for one week, which is common uh, for them to, um, for practice, and it's, it, they kind of didn't want to practice for longer and didn't want to be in Zurich for longer, and normally for a race, they wouldn't uh, practice for longer. One week is, is plenty, but of course, they were already world champions when they started, whereas Swift knew nothing about quadrotors. I mean, it starts out uh, a complete uh, tabula rasa. Overall, uh, on balance, first of all, we think this is an AlphaGo-like moment for robotics. This is a moment when machine learning uh, delivers a system that beats human world champions at an existing physical sport. With that, we need to remember that we're, we're so, so far uh, from what humans can do. Humans are incredibly flexible in so many ways and can do uh, so much more. There are a number of uh, limitations here. Um, Swift, in its, in its current configuration, doesn't handle dramatic changes in illumination conditions, or if we put different gate designs on the track, doesn't handle that well at all. This is actually not a deep limitation. We know exactly what, uh, what to do. This is due to the gate detector. The, the gate detector is fairly brittle because of the data it was trained on. It was trained on fairly narrow data. What you do is collect broader data or, and or uh, simulated, uh, much more diverse simulated data. For new tracks, neither of the two sides would deal with new tracks very gracefully but humans would get through. They wouldn't uh, achieve champion level times at new tracks, but, uh, but, but they, they could plod through um, plausibly. Uh, even the very first time they fly through, uh, through a track, whereas Swift wouldn't even know what to do. This is completely outside of its uh, operating regime. One thing that we observed that was just a dramatic difference between the, the human pilots and, and Swift is what happened after a gate was clipped or the two drones uh, crashed during a race. Swift basically went out of commission. It just couldn't, couldn't continue at all. Humans could, could basically take off even if one of the rotors was damaged. Uh, the, the quad could be you know, half trashed. And they would still, if there was some way to take off, some dynamic, dynamically feasible way for this thing to limp in the air to the finish line, they would do it, okay? And that is incredible. Uh, we, were, we were just amazed um, by, by the flexibility and, uh, and, and creativity uh, there. And of course, you know, humans don't only race drones, they can swim and cook. And, uh, uh, and, and do so many things, and Swift does one thing. Yes, of course, AlphaGo also, not only could, could it only play Go, but it could only play Go on a 19 by 19 board, the same thing actually couldn't function well on, let's say, a 17 by 17 board. After that, the field introduced other ideas and other architectures for more flexibility, which I think is also what's going to happen here um, in, in, in robotics. Now, I'm out of time. There is the science robotics paper. Let me try to do like a fast forward, like a two minute summary of the science, science robotics paper to give you a preview. Okay. Um, first question, should we do something like this? If we're pushing into performance limits, should we use reinforcement learning as we, uh, as we did in the, in the Nature paper, or should we use optimal, optimal control? We ran controlled experiments. Outcome is reinforcement learning is, is better. We implemented state-of-the-art optimal, uh, optimal control approaches, really tried to push them to their limits, and went to the comfort zone of optimal control and did it in motion capture and gave it reliable state estimates. Okay, so forget about perception. You get perfect perception. You just need to race. Even there, reinforcement, uh, reinforcement learning 
uh, one with a realistic, um, with a real drone in the physical world. Why we're in some controlled experiments? It's because RL can optimize a, a more flexible objective, an objective that doesn't have to comp uh, comply, conform to the planning and control structure of optimal controllers that have some intermediate representation. That intermediate representation in the form of a path or a trajectory um, is constraining the objective to the point that that's what gives RL the decisive uh, advantage, that it can optimize a non-differentiable, non-continuous objective that's really completely, uh, completely freeform. You can just express your task almost declaratively as an objective, feed it to, um, to RL, it will optimize that is why. That is uh, its, uh, its advantage. And more is in the paper. As part of this, we did race in motion capture, okay? And that's just cool, and I will show you, uh, and I will show you what happens. What happens is, of course, motion capture is cheating, right? I mean, that, I, I don't like it. Uh, okay, it's, it's completely cheating. But in motion capture, uh, this methodology achieves stunning, superhuman results. I mean, it goes up to more, uh, more than 10G in accelerations, um, more than 100 uh, kilometers an hour, and outraces uh, the human champions at, at a level that is just stunning to, to everyone. Again, it's cheating, right? It's really inhuman, an inhuman way to operate. Uh, where perception is basically solved and you get reliable state estimates at high frequency from motion capture. But it does happen, and I'll show you what happens just for the entertainment value. The peak velocity of 108 kilometers per hour. All right, the whole thing is trained with RL. It's basically the same program, only everything is simpler. You don't need a gate detector, convnet, uh, uh, because you get state estimates from the, uh, the mocap system. So you train this policy that ingests state estimates from the, from the mocap uh, system and actuates the drone, 10 minutes of wall time, much more in subjective time, but 10 minutes of wall time on a single workstation is done. So here's the last clip, and I'll show you some reactions of uh, the human uh, world champions after, after they see this, and, uh, and then we're done. <laughs> so you're hearing the human world champions, and here they are. All right, so this is what you get in the limit. This is what you get when perception is solved, okay? All right, thank you very much. Great presentation. So we're going to have time we just for a couple of questions. We're out of time, but I hope we can tackle maybe a couple of questions if you have any. Um, you mentioned that we're comparing RL to um, optimal control. You said like the RL can avoid the problem of like certain forms of uh, constraints uh, in optimal control. What are some constraints? Yeah. So generally, the uh, the controllers we um, we looked at um, take the form that there is an optimizer of some sort that optimizes an optimal trajectory, an optimal path, and then there is a controller that tracks that trajectory with some error function. There's always some trajectory-like intermediate representation, okay? That, that, that 
form doesn't exist uh, in RL. It doesn't have to. RL doesn't have to conform to this general structure. And that general structure, uh, our experiments indicate, is, uh, is, is, is limiting. I see. Thank you. Maybe a follow up on that. So the RL part will figure out a better objective. It will figure out better the dynamics of the platform. What is the role of computational latency? Like, you know, is RL closing the control loop faster because it's running on GPU and it's closing the loop faster, or that's not a consideration? Oh, uh, I, I imagine I'm, the optimal control will be much slower to run, right? Oh, I see. Um, I'm not sure. I don't remember if we measured that, if that was a consideration. I'm kind of hoping that that wasn't a factor because I don't remember that being a factor that we looked at. So we should look at it and double check that that's not where, uh, where the devil lies. Because somehow, like, you know, um, I was thinking about the interplay between learning and standard model-based stuff, right? And it yeah. seems that, you know, whenever the standard model-based model stuff, for example, VIO, yeah. is running fast enough because it's running on an ASIC, you oh, put it in, oh. right? So okay, let me, let, me, let me give you a trial answer that might just be the right, uh, the right answer. Our controlled experiments, many of our controlled experiments, and some of the clearest, most clean, most controlled experiments were done in simulation to tease apart different factors and control uh, and compare different forms of optimal control and RL. And there, uh, the computation, no, the inference time and the latency don't come in. We basically stop time until the controller uh, makes a prediction, then we take another time step uh, and so forth. So, I hope that the right answer is that in those experiments, this was not a factor at all. This was equalized completely. Okay, thanks. Cool, thanks for a great talk. So you mentioned that like a lot of the system components were the same as they were in six years ago. And so do you think there's any lessons you could have taken back six years ago and like be able to like do this six years earlier? Yeah. I mean, one thing we did is build, build up the simulation infrastructure. So for example, this flight mare uh, simulator that ended up, uh, ended up being used for this work did not exist five years ago. Um, there is the whole understanding of the, of the methodology. I'm, I don't remember to what extent we really tapped into advanced Autodiff tools. Uh, you know, like PyTorch in its very flexible, very modern form. This ends up making a huge difference and is a huge enabler in other, other projects uh, that, that, that I've been part of uh, recently. Here, the eventual architectures are very, uh, are very simple. I don't remember for training we needed something that is easier to do now than uh, five years ago. I think we just understand uh, much more um, simulation infrastructure is farther along. I think our understanding of this whole field is farther along. I think structurally, maybe if eight years ago somebody just told us exactly what to do, probably five years ago we could have staged the race and won. Thank you. All right, folks. I believe we are way past the hour, and you have to go back to your ECRA paper. So let's thank Vladimir again. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.